Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another in our series of Unexpected Conversations. It's a privilege for me today to welcome and introduce to you Dr. Benjamin Fry, or Ben Fry. Um, and he may have other ways of more um, casually introducing himself and the way that uh, he works and what he does, but his work today is a remarkable com combination of computer, computational design and elements and more of the aesthetic, or I don't know if it's reasonable to say artistic design, uh, but clearly a different way to look at information. So it occurs to me as, I, as I'm looking at a medical record every day in our beloved electronic format, I, I kind of take that information. Um, increasingly what I have to do is scribble notes, and then I have to reconstruct that and then I put it back in the record in the same series of words and phrases. Well, not in the same, but in my series of words and phrases that make sense to me. Um, and it's done at one point in time. And another of my colleagues is going to do the same thing a week later and maybe a month later. And often I'm looking at things that cardiologists and other places have done in, in essence in the same way. And it is an absolutely crazy way for us to manage all of this clinical data and look at it. And I can tell you that there are lots of things then that are actually missed in that circumstance, especially in the modern electronic medical record that reproduces everything, including all of the, error, all of the errors that are made in construction and entry along the way. There has to be a better way. Ben's going to tell us that better way. <laughs> so, uh, I need more than half an hour. <laughs> so that's one of the reasons we're pleased to have him with us uh, today. We, in the CFI, we've begun to deal with this a couple of times in some of our code projects by changing the way that we look at the medical record, more of a, a graphic representation rather than words on a page. And that's just our simple approach to it. His solutions are obviously going to be much more elegant. Um, he will tell you a lot about his work, and I'm sure you'll be excited about it. But since his um, graduation from MIT, where he earned his PhD in aesthetics and computational design, his career has really been meteoric. He has already authored three books. He's an author of a number of blogs. He speaks around the world. He's spoken everywhere except probably the North Pole. Um, he has earned considerable recognition at an early phase of his career. In fact, in 2011, he was recognized by Fast Company. He was recognized by Slate. He won a National Design Award for which he was recognized at the White House, all in one year. So a remarkable guy. It's uh, great for us to have him with us today. He's going to take some time to talk to you, and then, as we always do in these conversations, we'll sit together and have some conversation, and we'd like to hear from you about some of the things that you would be interested in as well. So obviously, your questions in that um, give and take will be welcomed, and we'll love to have them. So Ben, welcome again to Mayo Clinic. We're pleased you'd come and share your Thanks insights so with us. Appreciate it. Thank you for uh, that really wonderful introduction. Um, it's quite an honor to be here at such an incredible institution and uh, have this conversation about um, healthcare and how information design and visualization might be brought to bear on some of the problems uh, in understanding data and the uh, sort of complexities that you're dealing with. And I'm drawn to this field in particular because uh, simply the sheer complexity of the problems being dealt with here in healthcare uh, in the mix of how these significant issues on the data side, but also because the data is always connected to individual people. And uh, to me, the interface between data and people is this field of design. Uh, and so I spend my career trying to figure out what the data means, but more importantly, how people can use it. And my tool is information design and visualization. And so over the last uh, 10 years, I've been running a, a studio in Boston uh, where we work on these, uh, these kinds of problems in terms of uh, understanding uh, large and complicated data sets. Uh, and we work across a number of different domains. Uh, in my graduate work, um, which I completed in 2004, um, was uh, focusing on applying this in, in the space of genetics. And so um, we'll talk a little bit about, uh, you know, so I'm just going to use this first part to go through a number of different examples across uh, sort of, you know, related and semi-related um, topics that um, in terms of uh, healthcare in particular, but 
what I'm hoping is that they might provide some prompts or sort of get, uh, get the wheels turning and get people, give some ideas about how this kind of work might apply to the uh, sorts of problems that you're dealing with uh, day to day. And I'll start with this quote. Um, this is a wonderful quote by Colin Ware. You know, so why should we be interested, interested in visualization? Because the human visual system is a pattern seeker of enormous power and subtlety. The eye and the visual cortex of the brain provide the highest bandwidth channel into human cognitive centers. Perception and cognition are closely interrelated, which is the reason why understanding and seeing are synonymous. So when we understand something, we say, I see, and that that's something that's um, really quite built in for us. So starting from the, uh, the genetic standpoint, so this was a, um, a diagram that appeared in Nature Genetics with some folks who I eventually wound up being uh, collaborators. This is looking at across a uh, 500,000 base uh, section of the, the genome. You know, we have a, a series of, uh, and it's just tracking uh, differences along, uh, along that stretch of the genome, looking at SNPs, uh, and then kind of grouping those together based on highly correlated uh, changes. And so, um, and amongst that, you know, so one person has this, uh, I'm sorry, about 76% of people have this GGACAA sequence. Uh, and then another 18% have this AAT and so forth. And so this is fairly typical of uh, the kind of diagram you see in a scientific journal. It's incredibly dense. There's a lot of very useful information here, but it uh, really takes some time to kind of sit down with it and, you know, kind of parse what's happening within it. But um, what they were trying to get across is the degree to which these letters would, you know, group together and uh, those, uh, those SNPs would form these uh, kind of haplotype blocks. Uh, and in, in trying to find other representations for this, this was uh, done by another group, you know, so because one of the, uh, each location is one of two letters, uh, we use these two different colors. And then vertically, it's instead of uh, printing out percentages, you know, we're, we're just going to proportion things vertically based on how often one, uh, one thing or another shows up. And then if, uh, you know, folks with this sequence here move on, you know, there's sort of some connections in between to see what the cross correlations are. Um, a third sort of competing representation of this was, um, you know, instead of trying to treat things as these discrete blocks, instead, you know, it's uh, a softer, more mathematical way of looking at it. So this idea of what were called LD units, and so we see those dots across the bottom and comparing those to the blocks themselves. And, you know, some folks like this one a little bit better than the blocks because, you know, this one feels a little bit more mathy, and mathy is smart, and mathy feels good, and, you know, that sort of thing. Um, in the course of developing these ideas, uh, the folks who did that original diagram developed a tool um, to actually analyze data in this way, and so this was the original version of the tool, and they were um, kind enough to make the code for that available, so I went in and um, started pulling it apart and trying to improve the design in, uh, in terms of how, uh, how it worked and how it communicated the, the information within it. And so what we have on the left and right is the exact same data. Um, but what we're trying to do is actually improve the density of information on the screen by simply uh, cleaning up the design. So the design is not so much just about, you know, choosing the right color, or making it prettier, or, you know, improving the aesthetic value of it or something like that, but rather increasing utility by actually increasing the density of information. Um, you know, there, we're never going to have less data. You know, we're only getting more data that we're having to deal with. And so it becomes incumbent then to be able to um, pack as much data as possible into a smaller, uh, uh, a small, as small as possible location and area. And even with something like this, um, having turned over the, the tool on the right-hand side to the uh, researchers at the time, one of the uh, responses that I got from uh, one of my collaborators was, it's too pretty, I don't feel like I'm doing science. And so, and this is even somebody who's an advocate for my work. And so there's this interesting thing that happens uh, in particular within science where if something is too slick or elegant, we have sort of a, a knee-jerk kind of, mm, that, can't be, that can't be real, it's a little too slick. Like it's a little too clean, a little too clear. And um, which is very different from, uh, from other fields. You know, if you have a, uh, you know, if you go to a store and their sign is kind of a little bit off or whatever, that's a visual cue that that store might be a little off. And so, um, the way that we, uh, so we need to kind of change uh, how we think about the way that information and uh, design actually is, you know, works within these fields. Um, returning to those, you know, those first few diagrams, what I was interested in doing is, you know, tr pulling ideas from each of them and putting them into the same uh, representation because 
uh, really they're all talking about the exact same thing. They're looking at the exact same data. And so um, built this uh, interactive uh, piece that lets you um, go through each of them. So starting from that initial, I'm sorry, starting from the second diagram that uh, using the colors, using, you know, vertically showing proportion and so forth. Um, we can switch over to the even spacing, so now we can see the individual letters, and so now I have that, you know, 76% with the GGAC, et cetera, and the 18% down here. Um, if I click on one of these sections, I can see just, uh, just the ones that are cross-correlated with it. Um, if I'm not into the spatial stuff, I can just switch over to the, you know, percentages, as we saw in the very uh, first version of the diagram. Um, I can move over to 3D, so I can actually see a little bit more of these connections between and sort of where they are, uh, you know, where they're located and what the cross uh, connections are. That's kind of the way, a waste of a additional dimension. So now I can, you know, why don't I take that other diagram and, and uh, put that in the Z axis and see what's, what's the difference between those two representations. And then having done that, I can look at it from the top and I have exactly that, um, that third diagram. And so here we're able to take, you know, several different ways of looking at the exact same data and kind of um, look at it, you know, somewhat literally from different, uh, different kinds of perspectives and, you know, each of which tell us something different. And uh, as a sub, you know, uh, part of this, what we've done is um, down in the corner, we have the parameters for the statistic that's being used to actually um, handle these uh, block configurations. And so by playing with the parameters of the uh, statistic and seeing how that readjusts the blocks, I can get some sense of, you know, how fragile is this? What's, you know, what's the nature of the data? You know, so how can we kind of poke and prod at the data to get a sense of um, what, its, what its actual meaning is? Um, and so this was really done more, and also that we can always hit undo. You know, we can always move back to the um, original version of that representation, but this involves some algorithmic work to make sure it can, uh, we can do this interactively and it's, that it's fast enough and so forth, but um, really changes the way that we think about working with the data. And, uh, you know, in terms of the, on the tools side, this is something that we try and carry into other work as well. So another pro uh, project we did, this is called uh, Mirador. This is looking at, um, actually in this case, it's looking at the uh, behavioral risk factor surveillance system from the CDC. So here's half a million data points, uh, looking at several thousand different indicators. And what the tool does is it's built to find uh, correlations between various parameters in that uh, enormous survey uh, data set. And so um, it has various, you know, elements that allow you to uh, kind of track things down and filter and, and so forth. And then we release that as just an open source tool that's available out there. And so this is uh, a long ways onto the, you know, sort of exploratory and analytic um, side of things. And on the other hand, sometimes we're working for uh, sort of a broader audience, sort of consumer audience and so forth. So uh, GE brought us in to uh, build something for a uh, health and human services event. Uh, they, they were doing an event around uh, building apps and tools using uh, HHS data. Uh, we came across the, uh, the CHSI, the Community Health Status Indicators, you know, really a fascinating um, data set looking at county by county level data and sort of the state of health. Um, but as often happens with, um, you know, government data sets like this, the interface is initially a bit obtuse, you know, so uh, first you select a year and then you select a state and then you select a county and then you get a representation of what's, you know, happening within that county and you can um, look at some of the other sub, you know, measures of that. And the problem that's happening here is that all those selections have to do with how the data is stored, not how you actually use it. You know, so because the data is stored state by state in separate databases because they all come in with different reporting requirements, that's now pushed over to the user instead of thinking about, well, how are users really going to use, uh, make use of this information? And so um, as a more, you know, consumer general audience thing, uh, we took this and turned it into an iPad app. Um, so this was 2012 or so, uh, 2012, 2013, and uh, just took all of that data, all the indicators, all 3,000 counties, and just made it very simple to swipe through all of those indicators. And, um, you know, so here we have a basic history function. You can uh, kind of move through uh, other things you've looked at, um, breakdown of demographics and summary, births, deaths, et cetera. Um, and then I can zoom into particular areas. And so by first starting with this overview, now I can go in and, you know, if I see something interesting happening, I can go in and look at that specific county. And now 
having selected a county, I get all those details back that were on that, uh, that later table. And so, you know, kind of switching this over, and kind of turning it upside down based on what was uh, relative to what was on that site. And the, um, the fun thing about this, though, is uh, so we put this online, and uh, made, it was a free app in the, um, the iTunes store, and, uh, and we got 100, over 100,000 downloads. You know, so here's all these people going and um, playing with what might be kind of, you know, they might have considered boring health data, but instead they're sitting there on their iPads kind of looking at their county and the ones next to them and things like that. And so I think one of the things I'm always interested in doing with our work is any time that you can kind of cross the barrier from, you know, the set of people who would have gone to that HHS site that morning versus the set of people who are actually going to sit there and play with that data and learn something from it and uh, maybe use that to generate some questions and uh, feed their curiosity, I think that's a, you know, a huge win for us. And so that's an interesting, um, you know, it's always kind of a target for us as far as who can we engage with this data. This is data that's affecting the people that are represented here, and so how do we actually get them uh, into it and, and thinking about it. Also on the uh, consumer side, we did some work with Nike a few years ago, and so um, at the time, they were still doing uh, what they called the fuel ban, which is sort of an activity tracker. Um, they've since gotten out of that business, but the activity trackers continue apace. You know, so Fitbit and uh, the Apple Watch does some of this too, as far as just tracking your activity over the course of the day. And you have a uh, with this particular device, you have minute by minute activity levels. And um, what we were able to do is uh, get access to the, their entire database, the entire set of people. Um, who are work, uh, who are wearing these uh, these bands? So uh, basically, s uh, several million days of you know uh, 1440 uh, minutes per day, and start you know be able to do anal uh, analysis on this, which is a lot of fun. Um, the raw data looks something like this. So here's about a month's worth of data from a, a single person. A workout uh, has a you know is a spike, uh, something like this. Here's a longer workout down here. And then you can just you know, sort of see some of these uh, basic day-to-day -day kind of patterns. And the way that it's represented back to the users is you know, really very, um, you know, they present a far more simplified version of it. This has been smoothed to the half hour, maybe even an hour. And um, it's just kind of focused on, well, getting to your, you know, your, your number and general ideas about, well, you were more active early in the day or less active late in the day and so forth. Um, and so we wanted to uh, try and give people something that was a little bit more uh, about them and about their, uh, their data in particular, you know, that because this was all being collected by Nike, how do you instead make that about the user instead of about, about Nike, say? And um, so we started developing these uh, posters. So this is a three-foot by two-foot um, poster intended to kind of be something that looks, that is your sort of fingerprint of activity. Um, it's meant to look interesting at a distance, you know, hanging in your office. That top two-thirds is, you know, kind of your fingerprint sort of thing. And then at the bottom, you have more of the details of day by day, how active or not um, you are. Um, and so the way to read this, uh, so this is 3 a.m. on the left-hand side and 3 a.m. on the right-hand side. And we've superimposed um, all of the days of activity that we have for that person. So uh, this person, this was actually our contact at Nike. Between 6 and 9 a.m., she's pretty good about getting out and uh, getting a workout in, um, sometimes over lunch. Um, and we can tell some other stuff about, you know, workouts per week and so forth. Um, this is another person. This was somebody in our uh, studio. So each morning he uh, bikes to work. He's good about um, getting out for uh, a walk at lunchtime. And then we keep him later and later in the evening to work on Nike projects. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, and also we can see things like, you know, his, uh, his Sundays are not days of rest. So his activity is uh, up by about 30% as he chases around his two uh, young daughters. And so we can start getting some of this feedback from, uh, from these plots because they have very different uh, sort of characters to them. Um, <laughs> this was somebody else from Nike who uh, does marathons and wins them. Um, <laughs> Which, you know, and so kind of from the intensity there, you can um, perhaps infer what sort of uh, person we're dealing with. Um, this was mine at the time. I, sort of, I am not running marathons. Um, but basically getting up at 6 and going to 11, and I stop and sort of have this steady state thing. And around this time, my daughter was born. And so you see a couple spikes over 
overnight as I'm pacing around the apartment. Um, but this was also a very helpful bit of feedback for me as far as my, uh, so my patterns no longer look like this because, you know, having seen this, it's like, oh, this is why, you know, this is how I feel uh, over the course of the day and so I can actually change behavior based on this. And so that's a really powerful thing too about seeing, uh, having your data sort of echoed back to you. Um, and these are just some of the other examples, you know, so um, an interesting sort of identifying um, uh, print for folks. Um, this is one of our developers, and then one day he let his wife borrow his fuel band, uh, and she got a she got a run in. Um, you know, so that was that was fun, and then we decided, you know, let's actually look at this. Um, you know, they were interested in seeing how activity was affected by weather, and so we went and uh, took the database and started pulling um, a year's worth of weather from several thousand uh, NOAA weather stations and correlating that back and forth with um, what people were doing on various days. And so, you know, here across the country, when it's 60 to 70 degrees out, um, this is what the activity levels look like. So uh, folks, you know, higher uh, represent more activity. Uh, and then as the temperature starts dropping, um, uh, in particular the south, getting a lot less active. And, um, you know, and meanwhile here in the 30 to 40 range, <laughs> You all are like hitting your stride. You're like, finally, some weather we can relate to. <laughs> so I don't know if that's just like people pacing around the skyways or just or what, but it's um, clearly you are, are quite in your element there. Um, and, you know, we can also do interesting things across countries. So uh, aggregating users uh, by country, we get ma incredibly, just massively different profile uh, changes as we look for um, you know, just what behavior looks like across various countries. Um, you know, so for instance, uh, with several uh, East Asian countries, we have uh, a much more specific lunch time. So you see sort of a, a you know, 12 o'clock, you know, folks actually going and um, at that mark point, you know, sort of getting up, heading to lunch, et cetera, it's in, in a much more coordinated way than we see in a lot of other countries. Um, or within Spain, so if you've ever tra traveled to Spain, you know the, uh, Spanish siesta, so folks starting their lunch, the siesta, there's this huge dip. So the dotted line is the um, compared to the U.S. And then they also skew much later in terms of, you know, folks heading to uh, dinner later. Um, Italy is uh, similar. There's also this uh, evening walk, you know, so you have dinner and then you go out uh, for the passagietta and um, folks kind of collectively take a walk. And so it's amazing to actually be able to see this play out uh, in the in the data itself. Um, here, you know, gender differences, uh, women are consistently more active than men, um, but also some of the differences in terms of what times of day um, are they more or less active. And so sometimes there's a, a switchover that happens. That, And so in a way that um, this is a very, very basic, you know, sort of raw material of a data set, but um, this, the idea of being able to do this large scale analysis of uh, people's behavior and, and habits is really uh, quite remarkable. Um, yeah, and in, also in terms of habit. So we are creatures of habit. We have these little, this is aggregating everybody across the entire database. And we have spikes of activity at 8, 8.30, 9. Like we live by our clocks. Um, and so fascinating to actually see that, um, see that show up as a, a real signal. Um, <laughs> this also works for particular days. So, um, we were curious about, you know, so Super Bowl Sunday, um, and sure enough, in the U.S., we all collectively sit down and um, watch the Super Bowl. And so we, um, we wanted to, you know, sort of build something that looked at that. So this was when the Ravens and uh, 49ers played. And so across the bottom, we have the, um, the U.S. average. And then uh, in yellow, we have the difference uh, in Baltimore, so how much more active Baltimore is at those times. And then in red, we have how much more active uh, folks in San Francisco are. And so uh, sure enough, here are, you know, touchdown Baltimore, and then everybody's kind of <laughs> up and off the couch and very excited. And, um, you know, and here this, this whole red section where uh, the 49ers started mounting a comeback. Um, so, you know, the San Francisco folks are excited, mm, you know, point of tension. And then finally, um, everybody freaking out because uh, Baltimore wins. And so, um, you know, the fact that we can also see this, uh, this kind of signal in the data is really quite fun. Um, and also things like 
so everyone gets up to move as soon as the first set of commercials starts going into halftime, and then everybody sits down for Beyonce. <laughs> so, which is the unofficial title, title of this piece, Everyone Sits for Beyonce. Um, returning to the uh, healthcare space more, more explicitly, uh, we did some work with Commonwealth Fund around their uh, biennial health insurance survey. Um, what we were looking to do here is make more accessible um, the results uh, for their survey. And, um, you know, so it's uh, really an incredible um, piece of uh, work that they put together. And being able to put that biennial survey in context with, um, you know, uh, prior surveys as well. And so uh, looking, you know, question to question, be able to see these, uh, these breakdowns, uh, get into the data a little bit more, and, um, you know, drawing some insights from it, uh, be able to download the actual data. So this is something more for uh, people on the research side, but it also needs to be accessible enough for journalists or other, um, other groups that might be uh, more technically minded, at least, uh, and wanting to dive into this data. And then we have some sophisticated filtering things as far as being able to, um, you know, filter based on particular ages or age ranges and seeing the data update based on, uh, based on that. And so, you know, some real simple querying things that you can do before you actually sit with your much more sophisticated tools that, um, you know, for doing other kinds of analysis. Again, what, what are ways that we can kind of poke at the data a little bit and kind of filter it in different ways and get some uh, insights from it? And then also be able to download the things that, you're, uh, that you filtered out and um, are interested in. And so that's for one type of audience as far as the folks who want to explore it. And then we built a second that was focused on just telling the baseline sort of story of you know, some of the top findings from the current you know, version of the biennial, biennial survey. And so you know, top level findings, the number of insured adults uh, dropped to 12% in 2016. Uh, young adults made the greatest uh, gains in coverage. And so we can see the breakdown by ages. Uh, Hispanics are still t uh, twice as likely not to have a consistent healthcare provider. Uh, poor Americans are more than likely to uh, miss preventive services and screening, and um, uninsured adults and how they, you know, how they're affected. And so, here we've taken that same data, but for a very different kind of audience. You know, we just want to be able to step through it a little bit and kind of understand what some of those, um, some some of those basic takeaways are. Um, or if you're looking at a, a particular one, you might uh, switch to, okay, so this is what's happening by age, but now I want to see it by race or by poverty level or um, just seeing everybody. And so um, giving people simple, uh, you know, handles into the, into the data so that they can do a little bit of exploration themselves, but hopefully without overwhelming them too much with um, too much of the detail. Let's see. This was a, um, you know, so that's more of a, you know, step-by-step -step animation or a step-by-step -step uh, slideshow sort of thing or the explorer before it. Um, other times we'll try and tell stories simply using animation, you know, so based on actual data um, or always based on real data, but this was something that we did with um, the CEO of the physician's organization at uh, Mass General Hospital, and he wanted to kind of talk about the overview of how uh, MGH was structured and, uh, and then in particular, how do uh, patient interactions work? And so uh, breaking that into, uh, you know, three different types of, um, three different types of interactions with type one being the simplest, uh, type three being more, more complex and where it gets more interesting for uh, how the mass general system works. Um, but again, trying to uh, convey his, his perspective on what do patient, uh, uh, patient and provider interactions look like, and who are the different people that are all kind of, you know, brought in to service that particular patient. And um, this is a very different kind of thing from, uh, say, the interactive piece, but it serves as a way of, uh, again, data-driven, but um, being able to convey a bit more about uh, what's actually happening within this, uh, within this set of data. So here we're into the, uh, the type two, slightly more complicated. Um, and as we move into the, uh, the type three, we'll be talking about a much more uh, complex story as well. Mm -hmm. 
my water break. So type 3 patient uh, comes in with a suspicious abdominal mass, abdominal mass talks to a nurse who uh, refers to a physician, uh, then is referred to an emergency medicine physician. And um, so as, as patients, um, folks may not necessarily see these sort of uh, interactions happening behind the scenes, but you know, how can you sort of draw some of these connections between all of those uh, folks that are uh, brought together to um, help, uh, help bring care to a particular patient? And we see it that uh, the level of complexity increases with um, different individuals that are brought, uh, brought into it. So now we're with the oncology surgeon on the end, and then going back to their, uh, their board, you know, so that's something that's going to be opaque to a patient, but um, all part of that, that broader system. Uh, others uh, check-ins, the other nurses that are involved in it as well, and you know, sort of how this all comes together for, a, um, and then with uh, follow-ups and so forth. So simply be able to take you know his concept of what you know how this uh, system works and be able to use this as a means of uh, explaining to others. Um, and so that that being an animation. Uh, Another completely different sort of format is um, doing these things as sort of installations or artwork. And so uh, MIT was putting up their, uh, their new Cancer Institute building a, a few years ago. They had the space. They contact, contacted a collaborator, a friend of mine, Casey Reese, uh, because he had done this piece for another, uh, another group. And they wanted us to do something uh, related to their work in, in cancer, um, but done as an artwork and installation for that, that lobby space. And so, um, they said, well, let's do something on uh, this cell cycle um, network uh, stuff that we're doing. Um, you know, here's our diagram of what it looks like. Makes sense. Um, here's what the, uh, the data looks like. So we're uh, looking at up and down regulation of various uh, proteins within uh, over the course of the cell cycle. Um, the raw data is something like this. And uh, so first we you know, built out sort of a, our version of what that network looks like and use that as a basis for uh, creating the forms that would go on the, uh, the print itself. And so uh, what we do is we play the, uh, we run the data through the network over time and uh, the various nodes being the, uh, the proteins uh, in the network, you know, kind of move about a bit based on what's, whether they're being up and down regulated, uh, they're colored in a similar way. And so then the final piece is something like this. So these are several different, inst uh, basically each one of these sections is one uh, moment in time. And then this is what it looks like as, that, as it's being constructed. So here are one, two, three, four different moments in time. And we're just kind of showing a section of uh, each of these dots uh, being individual proteins. And then uh, they're kind of tracing out um, a pathway as they, as they move uh, through time. And so here this is something that's done as a, uh, you know, it's something that is meant to be, you know, sort of inspire uh, people's interest and curiosity as they're coming through. Um, but again, sort of working off of the, uh, the data itself. And one of the things I like about working with this, uh, this kind of thing is that it always feeds back into the, um, the other kinds of work that we do. And so um, the, uh, the last thing I'll show here, um, or actually before I get into that, the uh, uh, Returning to the design point, just the sheer number of iterations that we go through in terms of trying to think through, you know, what's the right way of uh, representing this, or what, you know, what do we want to do visually, and what do we want to focus on? Is it the connections? Is it the uh, the individual proteins? Is it those points? What's an appropriate color palette, and so forth? And this is, uh, I think we had about 40 or 50 <laughs> different rounds uh, that we went through over the course of, I think, about two weeks as we were um, developing this. Um, but then. You know, sort of getting to this point of how this actually, how this winds up affecting our other work that might be much more tool oriented. So this is a current, um, we're just uh, two weeks into this project where uh, we're working with a bunch of raw data uh, on, with a group from Stanford working in um, system, systems biology where they have modeled uh, an E. coli cell in software. And so they need a way of actually understanding what's happening with their model and uh, at various you know, points in time and being able to understand those, uh, those interactions and the data that they're getting back, and both as a way of debugging the model, but also as a way of you know, 
starting to do uh, cell work in software, which is really uh, a pretty remarkable sort of thing. And so, um, so here we have, you know, basically a tool that's doing the same kinds of things as we were doing in that previous artwork. Um, but instead, uh, here we have a very different task of being able to tie kind of what's happening in the network and a researcher wanting to say, wait, that looks interesting and I want to go back and uh, see a specific point in time um, and see what's actually happening across uh, the, other, uh, the other related uh, proteins in the pathway or uh, the various other processes that are happening within the, uh, within the cell. So, um, so we look forward to finishing that one over the next few weeks. Um, this summer. Um, and then just to, to close, um, you know, sort of the four main themes that we're looking at when, whenever doing uh, design and visualization, uh, what we're after is, you know, first simply communicating. So a field only moves as quickly as you can actually communicate ideas amongst uh, people within that field. A number of these pieces are about, you know, so the, uh, the Commonwealth Fund piece or the Mass General um, Animation. These are about just simply communicating uh, a point of view or a way of thinking. Um, consider is about being able to take enormous amounts of information and put it into a small space. You know, so with that um, iPad app that lets us look at the county health data, we can now suddenly consider all 3,000 counties at once and do that across the 80 different indicators that are, um, that are there. Um, closely related is being able to condense the amount of information. So with the, uh, say, the Nike activity stuff, we've taken, you know, literally billions of data points and we're uh, able to put that together in a way that we can layer, to, uh, layer in sets of information that might be more or less relevant at any particular point. And then finally, this point of conceive. So I think one of the problems in terms of understanding data and understanding uh, complex data sets is a sort of failure of imagination as far as, well, does it have to be like this? Like, do our EMRs have to look like this? Are there, is there not a, a way that we can kind of put these things together that actually do a better job in terms of servicing both the end, uh, the end users, whether those are the uh, providers or the, uh, the patients themselves. And would those views not also be very different? And also, you know, what are the kinds of views that are needed by people who are trying to look at things hospital-wide? And so um, really what we're trying to do is uh, encourage people to think, uh, think differently about and have different expectations about what their tools uh, should be able to do. So I will close there. Thanks very much. So we'll sit here and uh, there are microphones going around. So yeah, jump up, Ryan, and um, welcome questions. So it's pretty remarkable to see a new art form. Sorry? It's pretty remarkable to see a new art form. <laughs> um, I was impressed when you said lack of imagination in terms of mm -hmm. thinking about looking at things differently. How do you overcome that lack of imagination? So. <clears throat> Our, our non-scalable approach has been to try and make as many things as possible, <laughs> but that is not a, um, that's not obviously not something that you can do at scale and also uh, requires access to the data in particular. You know, so if you think about something like the, you know, say the questions that we're asking of that activity data, we might have some sense of, yeah, you could probably, you know, here are the kinds of things you could do with a global scale data set on, uh, individual activity, but without that data, we can't do much with it. Uh, one of the reasons that I got in, involved in uh, looking at genetic data was that uh, I was starting my PhD in 2000. The draft of the human genome uh, was first available, and luckily the folks working on the public project were so aggressive about getting the data out there that um, it meant somebody like me, who didn't at the time have any connection to uh, researchers in that field, could start looking at it and pulling it apart and learning about it and seeing what was there. And so, um, and then, you know, fast forward to now, we have things like uh, Apple just announcing that with iOS that uh, the next version, or, next, or the current version, um, having access to actual medical records, you know, on the phone. And that, uh, for me, as somebody who, you know, uh, is interested in doing these things, that's a pretty exciting development as far as, that means we can actually just start building stuff based on, you know, like what we feel like an EMR should look like. And especially what a patient focused look at their own uh, medical data might look like. And that doesn't, that no longer requires me partnering with Epic or, you know, somebody else to actually get access to my data, much less, you know, anybody else. Any questions quickly? So coming to the medical record. Yes, sir. 
Sometimes it's several weeks. It's so the, so the question, so we try to get the, the microphone to people so that the yeah. people who are online will hear us. But the question was, how do you do this so fast? So, so the, uh, the one at the end there, that, that being a couple weeks, um, uh, I have a, you know, we have a, a way of working uh, in software that's very close to the way you work in design in terms of trying to make something very quickly. You know, we call it sketching, uh, even though we're working within code. And so uh, the person building that has now been with us for six years, um, and so he has a lot of practice at doing that. And he just, he's really good about, you know, just uh, kind of throwing the stuff together. And then uh, it's great because then we're in a spot where we can uh, respond to it and say, okay, let's, you know, start fixing the design. Let's, um, uh, the, our collaborators that we're, that we're working with, they can start giving feedback about like, mm, less of that, more of this. Like, oh, I didn't know that we could actually do this or. You know, uh, they might also say, oh, we need to give you this other layer, you know, layer of data or two that they want to add to it. And so, um, so it's a very different um, approach to working with problems like this that it's kind of upside down from the software engineering approach where it's, well, you're going to sit down, you're going to have this, you know, nine month or 18 month timeline and sort of, you know, what are the data structures and what are the functions and the API, you know, the inputs and outputs and so forth. But instead, uh, let's build stuff quickly and uh, take a look at it and just iterate on it heavily from there. Thank you. Other questions? Ryan, turn around right in front of you. Um, I'm curious to know what software and or programming languages you guys use to make those visualizations. So we, um, we use a couple of different things uh, depending on the nature of the, um, the problem. Uh, Let's see, so a lot of uh, Python, JavaScript, and Java are kind of the, the main three that we spend time with. Um, I've been involved in a project called uh, Processing, which is sort of a, a library, library and environment on top of Java that makes it easier to build things like this. That was a core part of um, that, uh, that first uh, you know, diagram that does the multiple perspectives that was built in, uh, built in Processing, and nowadays, 15 years later, we can just do that in JavaScript in a browser, and it's a lot, a lot easier. Um, and yes, yeah, so we just kind of use different, different kinds of tools for the, for the job, and we have some internal things that we use, or we use the processing stuff as well. Yes, sir. I actually have two questions. Um, so the first one has to do with privacy. How do you deal with the issue of, of personal data and privacy? Um, I don't know if you're aware, but in Minnesota, we are the only state in the union where you cannot use medical record data without permission from the patient. Um, we have Minnesota research authorization is what it's called. Yeah. So that um, should be just, and then I'll, I'll ask my second question after. So um, there are always specific constraints that we're dealing with uh, given the data sets that we're, lo we're looking at. You know, so, um, Let's see, yeah, it's, it's just a, a very much a case-by-case -case basis kind of thing um, as far as the, uh, and a lot of times, you know, so for instance, we had uh, very strict constraints with the Nike data as far as what, what we could do or who had access to it or how it was stored at, uh, at rest and things like that. And so. I guess I was thinking about, I assume you publish some of this, and when you're going to publish, you have to have usually have to have institutional yeah. review board of some sort and so yeah, what's so, the oversight for your group and some of it um, and so some of it is unpublished as a result of that so the okay. stuff there is uh, is not stuff that we published and, and put out there in part because that's a much you know larger maze and also in particular uh, that it was not something necessarily of interest to Nike proper you know that that wasn't that's not how they interface with their customers or think about their customers um, they were uh, you know that the, the poster itself was something that um, actually happened kind of as a, uh, almost as an accident. You know, like we were, we were building ourselves because we were playing with our, uh, we were able to play with our own data because they had an API to use it. And so we sent, uh, we sent one of the posters to our contact uh, and she's like, wow, this is so cool. Can we do this for everybody? And it's like December 20th. And she's like, can we do it by January 1st? And we're like, maybe, we'll see. <laughs> so, um, so it really, you know, depends on the uh, on the domain, uh, and you know, each project ends up being different as far as really having to um, lock things down or keep things encrypted or you know various other constraints on it. My my second question is completely unrelated, but it's more of a design question. So, the subjectivity of color palettes and and this kind of stuff. So, 
I'm a statistician, and when we create mm -hmm. our our figures, we're often borrowing things, for example, from Cynthia Brewer's website. I don't know if you're familiar with Color Brewer, mm -hmm. um, and you know, trying to make things colorblind, you know, yeah, sure. friendly, and all this kind of stuff. How do you deal with the? And I saw that you did 40 iterations, but at what point do you say stop? And how do you deal with the subjectivity of the the visualization sure. component? Yeah. The, um... As far as the when to say stop, so that's now my job. <laughs> as far as you know, that I I'm the um, uh, in charge of doing that within the you know within the studio and saying we need to push this further, or um, I have to act as translator for you know our various audiences that we're uh, going to be showing this to, whether that's you know simply the client in question or who the client is uh, creating this for, um, and. I think one, I, the most useful way I, I think of it is um, that it's a lot like writing. And so the kinds of, just, you know, that there will be a degree of subjectivity to it, but given any particular, any piece of writing that you do, you are writing for a particular audience. You know, a novel is different from a uh, historical work of nonfiction, which is different from a thousand word article in a, um, a newspaper daily. And I think one of the, uh, and that's one of the things that we need to think about more within the visualization space is that there's a tendency um, in terms of the academic dogma around visualization and so forth to kind of treat everything as one big thing. And it's a little bit like, you know, you've got, I picture like children's book authors fighting with like history professors about textbooks. You know, it's like we're talking, you know, we're building different, very different kinds of, of animals. And, um, in terms of the you know specific choices on color and things like that, it's that comes down to appropriateness for particular audiences and particular contexts in which it's going to be used. So, if it's something that's going out to an extremely large audience and we need to make sure that we're addressing color blindness, then that that's simply a design constraint that we built into it. Um, if it's something that's being done for an internal analysis tool or something like that, that that's less of a factor. Um, that's that becomes less important. And so we spend a lot of time. Uh, especially early in the project, figuring out who, you know, who's the audience this is going to and what is appropriate for that audience in terms of level of finish and things like that. Um, even for the, some of the genetics work, for instance, going too far on the design side would, would actually be a, uh, more of a problem because people get distracted by it being too shiny and, you know, begin not trusting it or, you know, something like that. But, um, but yeah, we just kind of treat those as design constraints, essentially. Another question, way in the back. Give us one minute to get there. Ryan's going as fast as he can. <laughs> Go ahead. How do you decide your uh, problem statement, like from the data or after seeing the data or before seeing the data? Or... So, yeah, that's a great question. It's. Um... It is something of a, a dance uh, for us in terms of when a, when a client contacts us and um, that there's a lot of back and forth in terms of, you know, they might contact us and say, we have this data and we'd like to do this with it or say X, Y, or Z with it. And because we don't have the data in hand, we have to kind of use our experience to guess it. Okay, do they have that data? Can it do that? <laughs> Can we, um, do we think, we can effectively tell the story that they're telling. Do we think that's a misleading story, or do we think that's actually something that's you know going to work? Uh, and so, even before we uh, have a contract in place, we have to sort out those issues ourselves. And then, once the contract is in place, there's still a great deal of back and forth, you know, so that uh, we take a look at the data. Um, so our our process is that we start by taking an initial look. We check that against what you know the initial problem statement is. Uh, we won't take projects that are too narrow in their problem statement if they say, we want to do this with the data and we know it says this, that we know the data is going to tell them something different and that they, uh, that they didn't expect. Um, and so there needs to be a certain degree of flexibility there. And so um, we keep doing updates based on, hey, here's what we're seeing. Does that, you know, uh, is that in line with what you're expecting out of it? And the kinds of things that we're seeing, are those useful for the, the message that you're trying to get across? You know, so it's why, for instance, with the the uh, tool for looking at the for doing the uh, cell network stuff at the end there, it's why we're trying to build a quick version of that initially, so that we can get it in their hands and they can say, 
oh no, we need to fix you know, a couple different things about our model before you guys even continue any further. Or they can say, mm, this looks wrong, we need to get you a completely new data set, which that's actually a, a very common response that people, um, people find uh, anomalies and errors in their data that they didn't expect. But in, uh, on seeing it visually the first time, it's really glaring and sort of front and center. So. Thank you. I have another question. I'm Go sorry. ahead. So it is regarding to structure of data. See, not every data is uh, structured, and that, uh, there are a lot of uh, you know null variables and other unstructured data. Uh, how do you do the data cleaning process? Like, how do you decide, and what is the process? In it, yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, it's tough to answer in the uh, in the broad sense. We. Um, one of the a significant line of work that we've been doing over the last uh, six months to a year has been around uh, text and basically having these, um, and actually really documents in general. So having uh, given Word, docu you know, Word, PowerPoint, uh, PDF, et cetera, all these different uh, document types of various lengths of various topics, you um, have this really heterogeneous set of information. You don't have useful metadata about it. Uh, how do you start making sense of that? And so um, we, uh, and that's been a you know set of uh, research we've been doing about um, you know I don't really believe in metadata ever really existing and working properly. And so how do you work without that metadata? And how do you uh, kind of work more from an assumption of things are less structured than everyone thinks, and therefore we need to kind of design around that. And so that's just kind of built into the the process and how we think about it. Yeah, um, I have a question about signal to noise. Is this something that you worry about? Um, for example, your original data may not have noise, but in transforming it, visualizing it from different angles and time scale, you might see something that is not there. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you worry about sometimes? Yeah, I mean, I, certainly that um, because I think you know any representation you choose to put on it is going to reveal different different sides of it, and also that those sides can often be uh, misleading or suggest something that's not necessarily there. And so um, that's another point wh uh, for why we do so much iteration on it. You know, so instead of saying, this is the way to visualize this particular data, we'll try a couple different things to make sure that it's actually revealing the stuff that um, is most, uh, most useful or most salient and not getting caught up in um, uh, just, you know, exposing those particular uh, points of noise or even points of, uh, I mean, so like a, a more concrete example, we had a, um, we were working with GE and looking at uh, wind turbine data and uh, started doing these plots of, you know, the uh, feed, feedback coming off of the uh, turbines themselves. And so uh, on the two axes you have uh, how fast the uh, turbine blade is going and on the other axis you have how much energy is coming out. And so the way it works for a wind turbine is that there's, it makes a sort of lovely S-curve. If everything's going well, you're somewhere along that uh, S-curve. But the thing that actually you find in, in terms of starting to plot that out, the first thing you notice is the anomalies in the data. So basically where, uh, you know, how you diverge from the S-curve. And, uh, and so that was a, not a useful representation of it. And not only was it not a useful representation of it, but the, um, it would also give away uh, proprietary aspects of their technology because one of the other things we had was the um, a sort of vector field showing you know, what direction the wind was going. And so during those anomalous cases, we were kind of showing exactly what was happening with the algorithm that they use. You know, so the, the wind turbines themselves try and kind of move a little bit to catch the wind. And so it's like suddenly we're revealing their proprietary algorithm about how they try and catch wind when things are breaking down. And so not only is it not this useful S-curve thing, but we're uh, visually we're going straight to the anomalies, and the anomalies are showing you know something proprietary that we don't want to get across. So we got a, a couple, we got a ways through that particular project, and then we had a project where we got on the call and people kept joining, and there were two or three different lawyers that were on it, and they said, you know, we're not going to do this. So <laughs> way in the back, Ryan. Then we'll come here at the front. So. Visualization uh, helps us make predictions that uh, could guide our, our uh, decisions and actions. And so um, given that there's so many different ways to represent the data, 
How, how do you uh, go about validating that you've represented it in the probably the, the most accurate way or the way that uh, resulted in the best decisions being made downstream? So uh, we spend a lot of time working with the domain experts within the data. You know, so we, uh, uh, one of the main, and it's part of what's, uh, what we enjoy about it too, as far as these these kinds of collaborations that we uh, we have along the way, but um, over the course of the project, we want to get feedback from them as far as is this actually you know pr uh, providing useful results, and is it going to um, uh, is it fulfilling the you know the um, is it as accurate as it as it can be, or are there ways that we can kind of shift it around to be more accurate? But um, it's a little tougher to answer in the, you know, that's the general answer, but um, in a more specific case, uh, but easier to kind of cover in a more specific case, so. Yes. Um, how do you engage your, sorry. Okay, how do you engage your users or customers? Like, what questions do you ask them? How often, like, how closely do you collaborate? And what do you need for this? Thing to happen. So we um, we typically uh, you know a typical project lines tends to run uh, ten or twelve weeks. We talk to them uh, weekly. We're working with a set of uh, people who are again sort of uh, domain experts. Um, they might uh, come by and actually you know sit with us in, in some cases. Um, and that we'll your conference is scheduled to end in two minutes. Presentation based on. Uh, their feedback uh, right there. Um, it's a lot of, you know, but essentially comes down to a lot of back and forth as far as, you know, uh, one week we're doing something on the back end of how the data actually works. The next week we're kind of applying a round of design to it. The next week we're doing something back end and that uh, checking in along the way to say, again, is this uh, conveying the things that you want it to convey? Is it, um, uh, is this going in the, a direction that you know makes sense? And so it's just a great deal of, of back and forth because um, for any of these things, where there is uh, and the most interesting problems all have a significant amount of domain expertise into it. So, so my question is: um, Is there any specific training that you had for your position, or a better way to state it is: What training did you have that was helpful to your position, and what training? Um, would have been beneficial that mm -hmm. you did not have? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm a weirder case because I started coding and doing design when I was really young. Um, that like, you know, sort of nine and 10 years old was interested in graphic design and was interested in computer science as sort of separate things. And did that for several years as sort of uh, parallel tracks and then Eventually, found uh, this graduate program. You know, as we were talking about it beforehand, that um, where it was other people who had done, uh, who had similar backgrounds. It's sort of some type of visual arts plus some type of uh, engineering or um, something on that side. And uh, but more typically, so say you know, for the people who I work with at um, at our studio, uh, people are kind of from all over the place. Like we have somebody who's. Um, used to do database stuff, but he decided he wanted to do interactive you know, front end things and people didn't really know what to do with them and so he found us. And other people who have done you know, mapping or cartography things, but then you know, they're like, we wanna do more interactive stuff or not just maps, but what, what do the maps mean and how do we you know, sort of make sense of it? Um, and so we have a real, uh, you know, real mix of backgrounds that are, uh, that are brought into it. Um, and I think in terms of, uh, what I wish I had in place, it would be more on the lines of um, uh, ways to get people, you know, so we spend a lot of time trying to teach designers how to code or coders how to do, do some design or people who have some analysis background to think about, you know, design and form and representations and things like that. And uh, we, um, like I teach an MIT class around that and, um, but we need a lot more of that. You know, like I wish I had better teaching materials and things to point people to and, you know, stuff like that around that because we have um, a lot of these, you know, that companies are now building out these data science groups, but it's like, okay, so we're doing this data science program, but they still are having trouble, push, you know, pushing things up the chain in ways that are understandable elsewhere. You know, like we um, we had a recent project with uh, 
with one of the big uh, media companies where basically the data science folks were able to predict and see that a particular film was gonna do exceptionally well based on this small set of data that they actually had. And so they wanted to be able to make the case to the uh, C-suite executives that um, you know, with more data, they can actually do that much better uh, with it. But they were having trouble making that jump, even though they're extremely facile with the data and you know, had all the charts and you know, things like that. And so that, that gap between you know, the data science and the, the storytelling aspect of it, or the, uh, you know, so there's some design in that, there's some writing in that, and, and so forth. And so it's just this mix of, mix of skills like that. We'll do the last question here in the back. Yes, uh, you mentioned um, when you go to sign contracts after you see the initial data, you often address anomalies and so forth like that. In your contracting um, decision making process, what are the red lines that you I, won't do? We don't get or, asked about contracting much. This is uh, well, great. I, this I'm I'm considering. <laughs> no, I, I there, have to there, think about this all day. So this you know, is, there are yeah. as many uh, reasons for presenting the data as our data points. So. Mm -hmm. Where, have you said no, we can't do that? Or when does that happen? Uh, that happens before, before we sign. And we've been lucky in that I can probably count on one hand the number of times that things have just, you know, uh, where it was not possible to proceed with, you know, where we were wrong in terms of being able to proceed with the data um, and uh, tell the kind of story that they, uh, they wanted to with it or build the tool that they, they wanted. And, in the majority of those cases, those were uh, companies with which we had long, uh, longer term relationships. And so it was a matter of, okay, we'll set that aside. And so it meant that we had burned a couple of weeks of time and we still had to find something else to deliver, um, which is part of the art of it as well, as far as, okay, we can't do that, but here's something, you know, here's something else we found along the way that we're gonna go in this completely separate direction. Um, and, uh, but we have not had to do much, you know, sort of rolling back and, in other sense, so, in, in fact, one of the one of our worst, you know, our toughest examples of that was actually looking at a, a massive EMR uh, data set, and we're like, this is going to be a gold mine, and uh, you know, millions and millions of patients, uh, all this information, it was not a gold mine; it was a mess, and so we were not able to, you know, and so uh, the kinds of things that they wanted to get out of it needed several more layers of of uh, uh, analysis and research and cleaning and, and so forth that we were not going to be able to do within the sort of you know time frame. I want to thank all of you for helping us have a wonderful conversation. Ben will be here for a few minutes after. Um, it's kind of amazing that we didn't see the one o'clock jump, the, the usually hourly jump that you've seen in your data, but normally yeah, right. we do. But he'll be here for a few minutes more to talk with you again. Thanks for coming for another in our series of Unexpected Conversations. Please join me in thanking Ben for having